I'm at the lovely Singapore Botanical Gardens early in the morning and they say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I have to be honest, it is not a meal that I usually take but I will make an exception today for my guest who is a public figure but has his roots through sports for the past 20 years. He's none other than Jose Raymond. Jose, good Hi. morning brother. Morning, morning. In the Singapore Botanical Gardens, we're at Casa Verde. This is fantastic. I've asked you to meet me to have this little chat, but you said, Duncan, let's do it in the morning. Why are we doing it so early? <laughs> I'm an early starter. Okay. And uh, I usually come here for my breakfast a couple of times a month. And uh, it's a nice, lovely, peaceful place filled up with all green surrounding us. And um, which is why I'm here to meet people very, very often. Well, today you are meeting me. So my question to you is, you want to makan? Let's go makan because I'm hungry. Let's go. All right, so for breakfast today, we chose the Western option instead of the Asian option. For the life of me, I thought you were gonna go with the nasi lemak or misiam, but you decided to go with the muesli. I've gone with eggs benedict. Eggs benedict for me, I just like the, the sophistication of it, making the egg and when you cut into it, you know, the, the yolk just uh, yep. falls over. But yep. muesli, Absolutely. going uh, Western today. The muesli is very easy for me to run through and go through as I'm having conversations with people. Uh, so okay. which is why usually I have a muesli and a coffee if I'm here. A bit difficult to have a conversation about nasi lemak or, or laksa. <laughs> laksa would be the worst. That would be the worst. Yeah, but on some other day, but not when you're having meeting people. Then yeah. you, in the start of the morning, you might have like stains on your shirt. So it's not going to work. So well, what's, your, what's, your, what's your regular day like? I mean, you're, you must be super busy on a daily basis. I, I, uh, sleep for, I sleep for about four and a half, five hours a day. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm up by about six every morning. Okay. Uh, and I go usually sleep by one, if not at the latest two, uh, because my days are very very long. So what I need to do is be up very early to clear work or read, um, get up to speed on what's happening. I meet with different clients on a daily basis, and all the clients I meet have got different subject matters. So, I mean, my, my, the verticals I have include healthcare, include uh, esports, include um, logistics, um, campaign related work. So it's very diverse, and that requires me to be able to switch from meeting to meeting uh, with all the information loaded up in my mind prior to the meetings. Yeah. Yeah, so that means I've got to always completely get prepared, completely before I start the day, because the meetings are all chock a block. But one, one after another. Well, no wonder we've started our our breakfast meeting very very early today. Yes. Um, yeah. My my whole intention of, of this of this series and, and to speak to personalities who have been involved in the sporting fraternity for 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 a, a period of time. And for you, you started as a, a journalist, uh, just a normal journalist. But then you've also won star, athlete story of the year as well. Um, how did you start in journalism? Because was it always a route that you wanted to go through? When I was about to complete my national service, there was this magazine at that time called Sports Singapore. It was a magazine which was being published uh, during the Nas Malaysia Cup period. Okay. Uh, this was in 1994, 1995. So uh, this magazine had a contest asking us to write in and describe who is a better footballer, Fandi Ahmad or V Sundramurthy, and, and what you win if your letter is the best is you get a binoculars. <laughs> Oh my God, that question is still being asked today. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the, what you win would be a pair of binoculars, yeah. right? Thank you. Thanks very much, Harry. Thank you. Thanks. And so I wrote in. I wrote to say that in my view, and give, I'll give quite a few reasons, I felt that Sundram was a better footballer. Wow. Anyway, all I wanted was the binoculars. Yeah. But 
what I had was the editor of the magazine calling me and asked me, could I meet you because I think I would like to hire you. Wow. So, so I said, okay, but I said, I'm in national service and I don't think I work for you. But what happened was a couple of months after I, I, I finished my service, I ended up working for this magazine for a couple of months. And that was the start of my journalism career. Wow. And so the people whom I actually had idolized as a growing up, Ended up, ended up becoming people who I worked with as a, I mean, they were my newsmakers. You won Ethnic Story of the Year, uh, 2015, was it? Or 2016? No, 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 that was 2005. 2005, you won yeah. Ethnic Story of the Year. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, what was the story about? Do you remember what you were writing about? Yeah, of course. Uh, that, that was at the, that was at the back of Singapore winning the Suzuki Cup in, oh, well, at that time, the Tiger Cup in January of 2005. And... That victory at the Suzuki Cup actually managed to fire up the football in some ways. Yeah. Um, I think at that time, Professor Ho Pinky was the president of FAS. And, and I, I mean, because of my, my work as a journalist and covering the sports beat, I actually ended up working with FAS quite a bit to show them that we need to do better in certain areas. And one of it was the need to pay our players better in their daily allowances when they turn up for national team uh, duties. And I can tell you that at that time, when I wrote this story, the national team players were getting $20 a day for their, as their allowance when they turn up for national, day du of national team duties. Yeah. And this had not been changed for about 10 to 15 years prior. So I actually then spoke to Ho Professor Ho and I said, um, we need to do better and we need to work on this. I mean, because we need to recognize that our players are giving a lot. Our players are sacrificing a lot. And it cannot be that, you know, their allowances have not been changed for the last 15 years or 10 years for that matter. And, and Professor Ho agreed with it. And then what happened was throughout that, there was talk of revamping the league. Yeah. There was talk about... Um, you know, what we can do for our national footballers a lot better. And at that time, we had a great coach already at Remmerich, who was our national coach. And I, was, I had a very good working relationship with him. Yeah. And we ended up working together on a lot of um, stories in a sense that we, 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 we don't get out and hammer the system. The whole model was to work with the people around us to do better for football. That means if I see that there is a problem, I don't. Hi. Thank you. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't just. We don't just expose the problem. We talk about the solution. What is the solution, right? And because that's going to propel the sport forward. Yeah. You know, so from a journalism, from a journalist perspective, you know, we put forward what we saw was a vision, and I think in the end, um, it worked out pretty well because that's what ended up me getting the story of the, story year. Of the year. But it wasn't so much me trying to aim for the story of the year. It was just me trying to help Singapore football. Okay, so let's dig in. Your muesli looks fantastic, by the way. Yeah, it's nice and colourful, right? Yeah, I like the bananas. And extra, absolutely the fruits, healthy. The strawberries. Yep, nice easily go down. How important is food in your life? You know, do you enjoy it? Or, or is it something like, I have to eat just to survive? Or like, you need to be good, it needs to be like the best. When the borders were open, I have an office in Malaysia. Mm. And I'll take drives up to Malaysia um, for my meetings, which are day trips sometimes. Yep. And when I'm there, I'll go look for the best food. Eh? Go to the coffee shop, which is 100 years old. Go look for the best nasi lemak in town. Go look for the best upper in town. I'm going to ask you something very controversial now. <laughs> From possibly the most controversial question you're going to get today. I think I know what you're going to ask me. You're going to ask me about the nasi lemak. <laughs> nasi lemak, Singapore or Malaysia? Or in general, okay? Remember where you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> I must say the Malaysian nasi lemma is to die for. Really? Yeah. The sambal is very different from the sambal we have here. Oh. Yeah. You know, I don't think many people will argue with you. I think yeah. Singaporeans, you know, we deny yeah. it, but I think in, deep down inside, I think we Even though we have yeah. got friends who run some nasi lemma places in Singapore, but I must say the nasi lemma in Malaysia is a lot different. And the texture, the food, the rice, the sambal, extremely different from the one we have in Singapore. All right, so back to my my earlier question mm. um, Singaporean journalists sports journalists are we very kind where we don't kind of push the boundaries don't really be controversial compared to like the British press who you know they hammer their own just for, for a story I think we, we are 
a lot easier on our newsmakers, especially today. And I know for a fact, I know for a fact that we 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 and and that's partly due to the fact that there's very little competition in the media spaces, right? So, and when there's very little uh, competition, um, there isn't really an urge to get out and break the controversial stories because that's what set you up, sets you apart. Yeah. So I think right now a lot of it is about preservation of relationships. Oh, I don't want to piss this person off, or I don't want to make that person upset because I'm not going to be able to get anything out of that person anymore. So I think that's what runs through the minds of uh, many journalists today. And I know this because I work with them still. I don't fault the journalists in the mainstream media for taking the position they have because it's also important to preserve relationships. Yeah. It's a fine balance. And that's a balance which I think is very hard to, to thread. You know, I mean, take a look at what I used to do in the past. So, you know, we used to write stories which um, we, we exposed match fixers, we exposed match fixing stories. I was a... I was a prosecution witness for the CPIB in a match fixing case because a story which I wrote led to the conviction of Chao Kwai Lam. Um, you know, so it was a story which I wrote which then led to the investigation. But you know, imagine what we were up against, right? We take risks. It is not that easy to go and try and take down a match fixing syndicate. No, I'm just thinking that, did you ever feel like, I don't know, maybe it's a bit extreme that, that you were you are pushing the boundaries, would you ever feel like your life was perhaps in danger because you're going to dangerous territory in a way? It never occurred to me that my life would be in danger. I believe in the Singapore system, we will be protected by the police if we try, if did anything happen to me. I've had my car tires punctured. But to me, it doesn't matter because the more you do that to me, the more I, the more I know I'm getting close. And that excites me. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's how I was. Almost like an adrenaline junkie, you are. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Just to wrap up this part of your, your journalism uh, career, what are some of the great stories that uh, you, you, you had uh, or some great interviews and uh, funny instances that you had with some of the sporting personalities in Singapore? Something that sticks out in your mind? I, I, I think my, my relationship and my time with a national coach, former national coach, Reddy Abramovich, when the, during the time he was a, a national coach, that period of time were the best days of my journalism career. Because, I mean, uh, let me give you a little bit of a background why it all worked out well. You know, when he, when Reddy first arrived in 2003, we were at the back of a lot of disappointments. 2000, 2002, national team losing 4-0 to Malaysia. So there was a lot of, we were, we were not really convinced that we were not, we wouldn't be able to take the ball forward. Yeah. But there was this, there's one day when Reddy met me and he said, let's have coffee. And he sat down with me and explained to me, off the record, what he was trying to do. Okay. Explained to me why he needed to inject life into the national team. Energy, youth, people are willing to take risks. The Bayhaqis, Cairo Lambris, the Redouan Mohammeds. He explained to me why these boys were going to be the future of our team. And he asked me this, he told me this, I just need you to believe me that I will do something for your football. It was at that moment that I decided I will back this guy. I will turn the way I report and write about the national team and support him and inspire the public to come and support the team. And that was when Reddy allowed me access to the, to the team, allowed me to follow them on trips. He allowed me to even sometimes go into the dressing room just to listen to how he was trying to inspire the boys. That never happens. Exactly. So he gave me the access. And when he when we were traveling, even for friendly matches, I used to follow him, Kuwait, Qatar. Um, he, he allows me into his room to see how he was pre preparing for matches. And it was through that that I understood this man. And we became very close. So imagine in 2003, middle of 2003, I decided, Let's, I'm going to back you. I'm going to yeah. try and find ways to back you. That year itself, the team ended up winning the Suzuki the Tiger Cup in 2004, 2005, right? And I had a front front seat view of whatever was going on. Wow. So it was a decision which I took to, okay, fine, let, let me list, I'll, I'll, I'll support you because you know what, now that you've spoken to me and I think I believe in the vision which you were trying to bring, I will back you. So that period of time was the best days of my journalism career before I left the media because I went to the, I mean, I, I had, I covered the Suzuki Cup, Tiger Cup and Suzuki Cup, 04, 05, 07. I went to the Asian Games in Qatar 
uh, also to cover football and, and, and the rest of the games itself. I went to the, I was in the SEA Games in 2005, I was in SEA Games in 2007, um, I was at the World Cup in 2006. But World Cup is because um, um, I, had, I had friends, uh, Mr. Teo Singh from Komoko, when he brought a small team and I was part of that team. And that's why I managed to get to know a lot more people in the sports, in the, in the football industry there. So it sounds like your journalism career was striving. You were given access that no other journalist would ever get. Um, you just tell by speaking to you that your passion for football is strong. Why then stop? Why did you then go to, to um, Sports Singapore or Singapore Sports Council as known back then and work uh, in the communications department? Because then you kind of became the anti-journalist okay. in a way. Not really. Okay, so in 2005, I won Aspect Story of the Year. In 2006, I was Media Corp's inaugural Journalist of the Year. Yeah. 2007, I won Story of the Year in Media Corp again. And I figured I had nothing to prove to in terms of my life as a journalist. Um, and I'm a bit of a risk taker. So I wanted to carve out something different and something new for myself. So I was constantly thinking about how I could upgrade myself or do something better or find a way to contribute back to the sports industry. So. I took a decision that I would leave when I'm at top of the game and start all over again. You've also um, been the, the vice president of the Singapore Swimming Association. There was about a time when you came in where a certain Jay Schooling uh, was on his way up to, to mega stardom, right? Did, was there a sense within the SSA during that time that, okay, we have somebody special here and he can create big things, thinking that, yeah, this guy has the potential to win Olympic gold. I think it's not just 2014, the year was 2014, it was not just 2014 that we recognised that we had star, right? Um, it was before that. And if you had been following Joseph Schooling for a year, a couple of years before that, you'll know that he was destined for greater things. And I must say that we are honoured in our lifetimes, yours and me, you yeah. and me, to be able to witness a Singaporean winning an Olympic gold at the Olympics, gold medal at the Olympics, and that's that makes us uh, privileged in some ways to actually be here at this time to sit there and watch. You know that that's how much it means to us. So when I see people getting out to this Joseph today, I think people don't recognize that what we have is a superstar who's a world beater. That's why we will do whatever we can and whatever we need to to defend him. So this begs the question, where are we now as, as, as a sporting nation with support from stakeholders, from just the general public on how they view sports and for the sportsmen themselves as they see sports as a future or perhaps as just a hobby, where are we now as a sporting nation? Public finances will always be finite. It's never infinite. You know, you'll, you, we will always be clamouring for more money, more money to do to achieve more for more programs or to, to, to fund more athletes, but it's always going to be finite. It's limited resources. So from a government's perspective, where would they put the money? From what I'm seeing, the very day when they changed, when they removed the word sports from the ministry to turn it into MCCY, Cultural Community and Youth, that signal was to grow the base of youth athletes or grow the base of young athletes. That means putting in a lot more resources into community uh, development, into grassroots development, into schools development, right? So what we need today is to help the NSAs become a lot more sustainable. Help them find more ways to raise more money. Help them to commercialize their assets, grow assets, bring in corporate partners, and obviously then to convince corporate partners that there is some future in Singapore sports and sports as a sector. You spoke about money, you spoke about sports, and I know there's uh, a particular project that's very close to your heart, and that is the Chiam Si Tong Sports Fund. How did that come about, um, and, and what exactly is the role that it plays? Sometime in 2016, in August, after Joseph won his gold medal, I received a ping on my Facebook Messenger saying that the Chiam wanted to meet me. And it was a third party. And, and the third party actually said, we'd like to see whether there was something which we could do to help athletes and sportsmen. So I explained to them 
what I knew of the funding mechanisms. And I also told them that um, if there are people whom we need to help today, it would be the athletes who are trying to get into um, eligibility for funding. And these are the ones who sometimes end up dropping out because they come from poor backgrounds or they don't have enough um, to pay for coaching or they don't have enough that push to, to see them yeah. cross the boundary. So what I did was I went to speak to Mr. Ang Peng Siang. So Peng Siang and I also go back a long way and, I, and Peng Siang is also a sports social activist. So I explained to Peng Siang what we were trying to do and asked him whether he would come and help. So Peng Siang said, yes, I'm on board. Let's, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's find a way to, to grow it. So then that's when, that's when we went and spoke to, brought UK Sham into the picture. We brought Mei Ui into the picture. Uh, so bit by bit, we grew it. Was, uh, it. was it easy to convince these big names that you're talking about to, to be part of this project? Yes, because of what we were trying to do. It was to help others, right? And because there was, at that time, um, apart from sport cares, which is actually government-led, there was no charity out there which was just dedicated towards helping athletes, sportsmen, sportswomen, or young athletes who are from under-resourced families. You know, because we believe that every athlete, every single individual who wants to play, who wants to be involved in sport, should have that opportunity no one should ever have to play with a pair of broken boots because of their family background. No one should be denied a place and opportunity to train because of their family background. So that was what we were trying to plug. And to me, it was, it's fine that, you know, there's, it's not glamorous. It is not glamorous at all. But it's okay because, you know, when we get out and go and raise money and help others, we walk away feeling happy because we see the athletes, you know, getting up and doing their best and this, they, they come back and say no thank you very much and to me that's, that's enough that's enough fantastic way to, to end the, the, the breakfast that we're having I'm almost done I, I think you're doing most of the talking so you you haven't really had a chance to, to actually get through the muesli um, awesome. let me ask you a, a question that um, I think I'm going to make a feature on uh, on every uh, episode of Wana Makan alright last meal what would it be you could choose anything it doesn't have to be one meal, one, one particular dish. It could be, you know, you have an appetizer, you're going to have a main course, you're going to have multiple main courses, but what would that spread be? I would actually want to have my curry and rice that's and it. chicken. Yeah. Comfort food. Yeah. You go back to basics. Yep. Because, you know, that's what I grew up with, with my mom's cooking, and that's what I want to have. Okay. That's, that's, that's probably what I want to remember as yeah, my last meal. As you were chasing the match fixing story, <laughs> little did you realize that that curry chicken and rice would, would have be, been my last meal. Last meal. Yeah.